Greetings Python coders, Alan D. Moore here, author of Mastering GUI Programming with Python, a book that will take you to the pot of gold at the end of the PyCute rainbow, available from the publisher Pact Publications or wherever fine books on programming are sold. Well, it's been a while since I've posted a video, and in that time I've had a lot of new subscribers. Thank you, all of you who have subscribed. Um, I've also had a lot of questions. People have been emailing me or commenting with their code. And while I'm not going to directly answer a lot of these questions because they get very specific about code and so forth, I did want to make a video that I hope will address some of the common problems that people run into. So today we're going to talk about structuring our application code, uh, basically building an infrastructure for our PyCute application. Now I want to preface this a bit because I've been criticized by people in the past, either in my books or videos or, or other places, that I overcomplicate things. Um, that all these classes and signals and slots and all this object-oriented type code is it's just overkill. You don't need that. So let me let me explain though, and and it's fine. I don't mind criticism. You can criticize me all you want, but I do want you to understand why we're doing all this, so you don't just write it off and not learn what I'm trying to teach here. If I were going to build bunk beds for my daughter's dollhouse. I could just take a couple of dowel rods and uh, maybe some cardboard and some hot glue and I could probably put together a usable bunk bed for a dollhouse for tiny little dolls to sleep in. On the other hand, if I want to make a bunk bed set for my teenage sons to actually sleep in, I can't just take that design and make it bigger. It would be very heavy and it would probably fall apart. If I'm going to build a bunk bed for real grown people, I need to have some infrastructure. I need to have supports. I need to be smart about how that's engineered and where the weight's going to be distributed and all that kind of stuff. It's the same thing with our code. All right, in these videos, we build small toy applications to basically just give you an idea of how, you know, how this code works. In the real world, you're going to go out and build a much larger application, a much more complicated application. And when you do that, you're going to need infrastructure that you wouldn't need with a simple little application with a couple of buttons. So what we're going to be working on today is sort of building an infrastructure and, and learning some principles about how we solve certain problems for big applications. We're going to see that there are some things we could do that would just work, but they're not the best approach when you want to scale up an application to something that actually gets some work done. I hope that makes sense. So. Uh, Let's get started. Okay, what you are seeing on the screen in front of you is the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B. Many of you probably own one of these or you've seen them before or you've seen an earlier version of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're not going to be talking about the Raspberry Pi per se today, but I want you to look at this because it's a good example of how a circuit board is designed. Now this simple little device, this tiny little device you can get for $35, $45, $55, $55, is incredibly complicated. If you were to break down all of the circuit paths on this unit and map them all out, you would the map would probably cover Texas, I don't know. Um, but it's a device that is several orders of magnitude more complicated than any machine that existed a hundred years ago. Super complicated. How are we able to build this device? How are people 
at a small startup in Britain able to build this device that is so complicated? Well, that's simple. They don't build it from scratch. They don't start with every little transistor and component and build it up from scratch. There's some structure and some organization. What's more, you can see how this is put together. There's different components, right? There's chips, there's connectors, um, there's some little resistors and capacitors and things. All of these things are commodity items. In other words, none of these things that are attached to the board here was specifically created for the Raspberry Pi. They're all just commodity items that are used in all kinds of devices. All right, these little resistors, for example, these are in everything. Pretty much any electronic device is going to have some of these. Um, this processor here is probably in all kinds of devices. It's probably in smart TVs. It's probably in routers. Um, you know, it's probably in whatever little computer-based device you have, your smart crock pot, right? There's going to be potentially this CPU or something like it in any device like that. Uh, you know, this LAN chip over here that, that does the networking, probably in all kinds of things that have networks. Each of these chips was designed not with the idea that it was going to be in a Raspberry Pi, but with the idea that it could be in anything that needs what it does. So at no point inside of this chip does it have any understanding that it's connected to this chip or this chip? Each of these chips is a self-contained device that only worries about what it needs to do inside. Okay. The thing that makes this collection of parts a Raspberry Pi is arguably one of the simplest components and that's the circuit board. Now, even though the circuit board is covered with all these complicated lines, effectively what the circuit board is, is just a bunch of wires. It's a bunch of wires that connect the different components. And so, while it doesn't actually do much, it is what makes this a Raspberry Pi. The fact that it's this circuit board and all these components are attached to it in just the right way. So I want you to think about this style of design that allows us to make horrendously complex machines amazingly easily. And I want us to apply this to our code. Let me close this picture and let's get into our script. Okay, so what I've got is a very simple application with a couple of Q widgets. Uh, I've got a main window here, which is just a Q widget. Um, it's got a label and it's got a button. And those have been laid out. Uh, this should all be familiar code to you if you've been with us so far. Just basic creating widgets and laying them out. Likewise, I've got a settings dialog. Uh, and it's got an input and a button. And I've also implemented a callback for the button. So when I click that button, this callback is going to run. Okay, now to tie these together, a lot of times when I'm making a little app, I will just use whatever the main window is, like whether it's a widget or a queue main window, I'll just kind of use that as the central hub of the application. I'll make all the connections there. Um, I'll create all the other window objects and widget objects there, backend objects. And that works okay for small things. Ideally though, we'd like a little separation of concerns. We don't want to bundle our GUI code too tightly to our, our back end, so to speak, or our central hub. So in this script, I'm actually subclassing Q application here to create what I'm calling an application object. So what this object does is it's, it's sort of the core. It's the circuit board of our application. It's where we're going to mount, so to speak, all of our other components 
and connect them together. Now you don't have to do this with a queue application object. I'm not saying necessarily that this is the right way to do it or the only way to do it or the preferred way to do it. This works and I don't really see a problem with it. There may be one. If you see one or if you encounter one, please do let us know in the comments. Um, another way you could do this would be to create a queue object subclass. You do want to be able to make signals in slots most likely, so I would say at the very minimum you should probably use a queue object. Queue application works as well, and you have to create one in every PyQt application, so might as well make use of that object and not just have it sitting there being useless. And semantically, it is queue application, so it makes sense to use it as an application object. Okay, so, so what does our application object do? Well, as you can see, the first thing we're doing is creating a main window, and we're showing it. We're also creating this settings dialog, but we're not showing it. Not yet. Uh, let me pop over the other frame here and show you what it does. All right, then in there it is, it's very simple. We have a label and we have our button. The button currently does nothing. Okay, so how should we get our settings dialog to launch from our main window? Let me talk about the different ways I've seen people approach this that don't work or don't work as well. The first thing you might think is, okay, Right here is my settings button. I know that in the constructor, I can specify a callback for clicked. So what should I do? How do I get a reference to the show method of the settings dialog, right? That's a built-in slot for queue widget, which will show the window. I just need to call that from this signal. So how, how should I do that? Well. Let's see, down here we have a global variable called app that references our application object. So perhaps I can use that. Let's try that. That'd be app.settingsdialog.show. All right, let's give that a try. Oops, I've got an indentation error. Okay, let's give this another shot here. Ah, okay, now we have a name error. Name app is not defined. Hmm, but I thought this was a global variable. Well, what's going on here? So app is created after main app init method returns. But the main app init method is where we're calling our main window constructor. And that's where I'm trying to reference app. So app actually hasn't been created yet. We don't have that global variable when this main window is being created. So that becomes a problem. So then I think maybe, well, what I could do is maybe create the settings dialog first, and then maybe we'll just pass it in. Let's, let's try that. Let's just pass this in. As a argument to the init method. So we'll say, uh, settings dialog and we can delete this let's try this now aha no crashes let's try the button and it works okay that works but there's a problem because eventually my settings dialog is going to have to reference the main window. Which means the main window is going to have to exist before I create my settings dialog if I do the same thing. If I want to pass main window into my setting dialog constructor, 
I, I won't be able to do that because one of them has to exist first. So th this approach is going to create some confusion down the line. But also let's think back to our circuit board. So in our circuit board, the individual chips, the components, don't know anything about the other components. Right? The, the idea that we're passing in a reference to this other component, to our, one of our sibling components, is, is just breaking that analogy to some degree. So this is not really a, a good idea as far as keeping our individual components isolated. This is what we would call tightly coupled objects. So I don't like this approach. This is not a good approach to scale up. And if you imagine if we had, you know, half a dozen, a dozen different dialog boxes that could be potentially shown, this is definitely not scale up. So let's remove this stuff for just a moment. Let's try a different approach. And we'll put the settings dialog back where it was. So we should probably make the connection here in our main app object because, you know, it's a circuit board. It's where the connections happen. So how should we do that? Well, let's see. We want our window dot clicked signal dot connect self dot settings dialog dot show. So what I've done here, just in case you're confused, here in the app object, I've reached into the main window, found that button, and connected its clicked signal to the settings dialog. Let's hop over here to our terminal. Let's run it. Oops. All right, let's give this a try. So this is working. And there's our settings dialog. So, okay, this approach works, but I have a problem with it. And let me try to explain what this, what this is. If we reference this button in main window from our app object. So what, what circuit board components do is they present an interface in the form of pins. That's the interface. If you want to interact with that component, you use the pins. You don't reach somewhere into the internals of the chip and connect in there. But that's what we're doing here uh, with our app object reaching deep into the main window. If we down the road want to maybe rework our interface and instead of having a button, maybe we want to have a, a hotkey, maybe we want to have a menu item, right? Who knows? We have some special control. We shouldn't have to change our main app. All the main app needs to worry about is that this window object, this main window object, is going to want to see the settings dialog. So let's implement that and the way we're going to implement that is to use a signal so let's think about this the main window can request this the settings dialog so let's go ahead and create a signal called settings requested and that's cute core dot oops high cute signal and we're going to give it a boolean argument and the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to connect it directly to the clicked signal which on a push button sends a boolean so we just want those to match we're not actually going to use that boolean value it has to do with latching buttons uh, but it should be there just for compatibility okay so what I've done here is I've created at the class level, a signal from our main window that's going to say the main window has requested a settings dialog. 
and instead of connecting the button's click signal directly, we're going to connect that external signal settings requested. Now what have I accomplished? You may think, well this is just adding another layer for no reason. Again, people saying you're overcomplicating this. Now what I've actually done is I've created an interface for that main window. I've defined an interface, which means if I want to go back in and change the main window in some way, as long as I don't change that external interface, I can refactor the internal, the internal code of the main window any way I need to without worry that it's going to break something else. That's called loose coupling, and that's a good thing uh, as your applications get more complicated. So let's go ahead and try this. All right, we've got our window, and settings, we get the settings dialog. Very good. All right. All right, now that we have got that working in a, a scalable way, the next thing we're going to do is work on getting our settings dialog to work. So what, what we want from our settings dialog is we would like to be able to enter something in the line edit and click submit and have it change the label in the main window. So how would we do that? A lot of people have sent me code um, with their attempts to get data from one window to another. And let's go through some of these ways that don't work. So one thing people might do is create a global variable. So let's say uh, we'll just call this label text. And then we'll go down here in our main window and we'll replace this with label text and in our settings dialog when we submit first we'll bring in global label text and then we'll set label text equal to uh, self.input.text. Let's see if that works. And here's our main window, open settings, test, submit. Nothing happened actually, the whole thing. Oh, there it is, sorry, got buried. But the window did not change. Okay, uh, just to be sure that we're getting the text, we'll go ahead and print it. Tell you what, let's assign it to a local variable. All right, here we go, settings. Test, submit, and we can see it, it did get our text, it printed it, but it did not change the label. Why doesn't this work? If you've used tkinter, uh, you've probably used the string vars, int vars, um, those special variable classes that tkinter has to bind uh, variables between objects. So you would create one of these variable objects, bind it to a label or a text box, and then when it changes somewhere else, it will change everywhere that it's bound. That's not how things are done in PyQt. And in fact, this doesn't work with normal Python variables. So your assumption is that here in main window, when you set the QLabels text to label text, that you're binding that variable. But that's not what's happening. Um, that variable is just a name that points at a string literal object in memory. And when you pass it in here, that string literal is passed in by value. So that the Q label is pointing at that string. It's, it's got that string associated with it. This variable name label text 
is meaningless. It's, it's no longer necessary. It's not saved. It's not bound in any way. When you change label text, when you use the assignment operator on it, you're pointing this name to a different string object. So that in no way affects this Q label, which is already pointed at a, a string object. It, this, this variable, long and short of it is, this variable is just a name that points at an object. It's not a way to bind values uh, between objects. So this, this global variable approach is not going to work. All right, let's remove that code. Uh, we'll keep the label text there. It's fine. Another approach you could think of as well. I've still got that global app variable. And surely by the time a settings dialog is showing, that uh, that app variable exists. Okay, and, and that would be true. Um, that app global variable would exist by this point. So we can say app main window um, dot label dot set text text. Okay, so now our on submit method is going to grab that global variable, reach into it, dig around, find the label, and set its text. Save that. Does this work? Settings, test, submit, and as you can see, it works. It changes the, the, the text. But is that the way we should be doing it? Is this approach going to scale? Again, the answer is no. We, we don't want to do this because again, you've got a component reaching through the circuit board into another component, digging around in its internals and making assumptions about how it's structured and how it's built. It's not a good approach. Okay. And, and let me give you an analogy here that might help you understand. So I have several children and sometimes I'll be busy doing something and I will need one of my children to come and talk to me, to ask them a question. And so I might say to my, my daughter who's standing there, go and tell your brother to come and see me. I need to talk to him. Now she will go find her brother and a few minutes later, I'll hear slamming doors and screaming and kicking and arguing. And I'll have to stop what I'm doing and go check it out. And it turns out that my daughter has decided that it's her job to go and make her brother stop what he's doing and come and see me. But that wasn't her job. Her job was to go and tell him that I wanted him to come see me. And so it creates a, a big ruckus. And I have to, you know, tell my children, look, I'm not telling you to make your siblings do things. I'm telling you to ask them to do something. Whether or not they do it is really between me and them. Uh, that's not your concern. You're just the messenger. In our code, we need to take the same approach. It is not settings dialogue's job to tell main window what to do. It's not settings dialogue's responsibility to make sure that this text gets changed. It's the job of setting dialogue to tell the application the user wants this code changed. The user wants this text changed. So right now what it's doing is settings dialogue is taking it upon itself to go and find that sibling object, that main window, and say hey, your text is changing. I'm going to make it happen. That's not what we want to happen. Okay, we are just interested in communicating a message here. So we're going to do that again using a signal. Okay, so we'll create a signal. We'll call it text submitted. Again, if you had a lot more options here, you'd probably want uh, a better name for that. PyCute signal, and that's going to pass a string. All right, so now we will use that signal.
to send out that text. On our main window, we need to build an interface to receive that text. So we use signals to send out information. To receive it, we need a slot or, you know, most of the time just a method will do. We don't actually need to create a slot in most cases. Uh, so we will call that um, change text. It will take self and text. And we'll say self.label set text text. Okay, uh, so again, we're accomplishing the same thing. And we're just doing it with some boundaries between these sibling objects. So let me connect this self dot settings dialog dot text submitted connect self dot main window dot change text. And let's see how many errors I made there. Settings, test, submit, whoops, my mistake. What we need to do is not call, but emit the signal. Yes, yeah, so just to review, because apparently I forgot, so maybe you will too, maybe not. Um, you don't call signals, we emit signals when we want to manually send them. Settings, test, submit, and it's changed. All right, so just to review. What we've got here is we've got our main app object. It is a subclass of Q application, and we're using this as our circuit board. It's going to be used to create instances of our components and connect them. In our component objects, we are not using references to our sibling objects, our sibling components. Instead, we're creating an interface using signals and slots so that we can send out communications because all we want to do is deliver messages. We don't want to force our sibling objects to do something. We're just sending messages. And in this way, you're going to find that if you make a larger and larger app, this is going to scale a lot better than if you are reaching into other objects and manipulating things directly. So anyway, that's all I have for today, and I hope that helps. I hope you're all doing well in this crazy year. Uh, hope you have a Merry Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate around this time of year. God bless you all. Please leave any questions you have or comments down there in the comments, and uh, I will try to address those.